and starting the webinar. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another fun little episode of our full cast fireside chat. Um, for those of you that don't know who I am, I am Tyler Simons, head of customer success at Fullcast, and we are a go-to-market planning and execution platform. Today, we're going to be talking a little bit about um, how we're going to get strategic value. I love this buzzword, strategic, and maybe we'll unpack what that actually means in real life. But how do we bring strategic value to um, the organization after we're done planning in the RevOps world, right? Because planning is like the big strategic thing that we're doing. And um, now that we're kind of all done, what are we doing? Um, and instead of just listening to me talk this whole time, we have brought Scott Malish onto our little get together today. And uh, I'll before we get into all the little details here, we'll have uh, Scott give us a little update on what he's up to. Awesome. Thanks, Tyler. Uh, and hello, everyone. Thanks for making time or thanks for uh, joining us. Uh, so yeah, I'm Scott Malish. I have been in the RevOps world for quite a while now. Um, I just joined a new company, Sigma Computing, as VP of RevOps, which I'm very excited about. Um, for those who aren't familiar, Sigma Computing's in the BI software space, um, and it's a very cool product. So I encourage you to, to check it out if you're, if you're looking for a BI tool. I spent the last two and a half years at a company called Own Backup, which um, does cloud-to-cloud -cloud backup and recovery. Um, and then prior to that, I was actually in the BI space as well, uh, uh, spending about five years at Sysense. Um, and then prior to my kind of B2B SaaS uh, you know, life, I was in RevOps roles, but in the ad tech and digital media space. So that's just a little bit about me. Just a little bit of experience. Yes. <clears throat> um, so I think I'll, I'll paint the picture, right? Like we, and I kind of already did this, but it's just like this planning exercise happens maybe the last like four months of the year, five months of the year, depending on how long you start really in those conversations. And um, once things are done, typically with like a, from the outsider looking in perspective, once we cut over and we go to that new fiscal plan, I see a lot of RevOps companies or a lot of RevOps organizations jump right into like this firefighting, tactical, dealing with tickets and cases coming in and change this account here and that. But really, as we start to see uh, the changes in our economic environment, we're starting to see a lot of like the RevOps organizations need to think more about um how to be more operationally efficient or effective. And essentially that to me is what strategic value is, is like really increasing either efficiency or effectiveness. So maybe we can talk a little bit about how we start with setting an agenda for like the last, the next like six months of the year in terms of what are we going to work on? What are we going to do? That's not just changing account owners. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's a great question, and and you kind of you know brought up an important insight for I think everyone to remember because as you exit budget planning uh, season, the last thing you want to think about is the budget. But you really have like a six month window, right? Because in, you know in my, my experience if you know you should really be doing at, you know minimum a two month likely three month kind of strategic planning business planning process um, from the revops you know driven by revops where you're you're doing a lot of analysis that underpins the assumptions and uh uh, uh things that you put into the budget so you really have like a six month window uh the good news is that you've already done a, a lot of work putting together the budget and so when i think about this question you know how do you set an agenda for what revops is going to do after the budget, you look at what you what you budgeted and you look at what plan you put together. Um, and in any ways, you know, your priorities are dictated from that. And, you know, what that means, um, especially when you think about strategic priorities, is like, what did what do you what assumptions uh, did you bake into the plan that is go that are required for you to, to hit to, to make the plan? Right. Like. 
you know, you might have said, look, we, we need to get more efficient. So we um, are banking on or working towards a 10% a improvement in our, you know, MQL to SQL conversion rate. And if we do that, voila, the model works, we reduce costs, we, you know, our revenue grows, it's all good. But how, how do you actually do that? Um, do you even know, you know, what your levers are um, and, and why your conversion rate is what it is, right? So that assumption alone, increasing conversion rate for this one part of the funnel is a huge initiative that's by definition cross-functional and requires, you know, I would argue RevOps to be at the forefront in bringing the teams together, doing the analysis to, to come up with an action plan, um, you know, project managing uh, uh, the initiative. And, and, you know, that really spans everything that RevOps deals with data and analysis, you know, business process, tech and tools, um, you know, putting that all together to, to, to make these, you know, some, you know, to make these performance uh, uh, KPIs better over time. So, you know, did you uh, assume any conversion rate improvements? Did you assume, you know, did you make any changes to your uh, ramp schedule for your AEs? Um, uh, you know, are you assuming any changes in, in win rates or ASP? How do you actually make those happen? Those are massive cross-functional projects and, and are very strategic. So that's kind of like the first thing that, that, that came to mind. Um, you know, and even if you didn't, you know, plan any uh, kind of, you know, ratio or, or, or performance rate changes, there's inevitably, uh, I'm assuming in your plan, um, things that you, you have to do uh, differently than last year, right? So I think there's a lot of attention being paid on net dollar retention and an existing customer bookings this year in particular, given the economic situation. And maybe you were planning on, you know, existing customer bookings to, to increase a lot over last year. That's not going to just happen, right? Like, so what do you, what are you actually going to do to make that happen? It's going to require, you know, uh, uh, better account planning for uh, the AEs. Maybe you put together uh, more disciplined, um, you know, ROE uh, for collaboration between AE and CSMs on, on how they actually work accounts um, and, and push for upsells. Um, so, you know, that's, that's the first thought that I uh, think of. And, you know, there, there also might be things that come out of the budget that, you know, kind of force your hand in terms of setting an agenda. For example, did you budget for new, any new tools? Um, you know, maybe you, maybe it's the year that you uh, are implementing a, 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 a forecasting tool, right? And so that's a, you know, a three to four month project at, at best, right? In terms of evaluating new uh, evaluating vendors, coming up the short list, right? Running the POC, implementing it, rolling out, enabling the field. Um, and lastly, you know, the last thought that comes to mind is, you know, outside of the budget and, and anything that comes out of that, that, you know, forces the, the RevOps team to work on, right? Like there might be some foundational kind of backlog projects that are just causing a lot of pain that you perpetually, you know, uh, 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 pushed off because it's never been a priority. Um, that's, you know, uh, it's always a good time to get started on those. Um, and, uh, you know, that that's another good source of, of setting the agenda, right? Like, is this the year that you finally uh, uh, move from leads to contacts? Is this the year that you fix all of your account data issues, right? Like there's, there's foundational, uh, things that, that cause pain for both the RevOps team, but also the field, which we'll get into, I think, uh, you know, a little bit later. Um, and, um, it's always a, a good time to, to get that done so that you fix it before the end of the year when you're, when you're doing all your planning again. So I'm hearing, I'm hearing like three buckets of things, right? Like we've got uh, the organizational, I don't know what to call this. Like it's like organizational, uh, it's like the NDR thing, right? I, I don't know what to, I'm not sure what to call it, but it's basically like, here's this metric that we're focused on, right? We know that we need to increase NDR. So that's one thing, and there's a subset of the projects that can be done 
to support that. And I do want to come back to that because I think that's an interesting thread to pull on. But then you've got tooling. And I think like software and tooling and this stuff really comes from um, pain that you see in prior years, whether that is manual work that's being done by people that shouldn't have to do it. Like you would rather have AEs sell. And if they're inputting data, this is a really basic example. If they're inputting data, then why not buy a third-party data tool to just enrich uh, mm -hmm. firmographic information or whatnot, rather than having your AEs do it because then they can spend more time selling. Um, so there's like software and stuff that you're going to implement to like alleviate some of that pain. And then the third piece is just uh, <laughs> broken things because the, it's like this a living, breathing organiz organization, right? And you're constantly changing and things end up breaking and you kind of just patch them as they go or fixing stuff. And I think that last bucket's mostly dealt with on the RevOps side in terms of just time, right? Your RevOps organization is just fixing things in the back end and it costs a lot of time to, to maintain that. So as you think about like which of these projects to work on and work on first, how do you start to like prioritize that, right? Like yeah. we've got NDR, which probably could be argued like this is the number one thing, but well, we don't have capacity on RevOps because we're doing this thing. So do we go fix this first before we get to NDR? And how do you start to like sort through this and yeah. figure out what you're going to do? Yeah. Um, so a couple of things come to mind in terms of how I approach prioritization. Um, and they're really just frameworks, right? Like there's no formula that tells you, right? Like you should always work on this. Um, although you could argue, right? Like anything that's going to help grow revenue, um, uh, might go to the top, but maybe not always the case. So I think of, you know, it's, it's kind of cliche, but like the matrix effort versus impact, right? Like obviously if there's low hanging fruit, low effort, high impact, that's obvious. Um, so I always think about, um, okay, what's the impact of this project? Um, and that could be revenue. Um, that could be time savings, time savings for the RevOps team, time savings for the field, right? Those are, sometimes those align, um, but sometimes it, it doesn't. Sometimes it's a kind of selfish project uh, that will only help RevOps um, that, you know, is really easy to deprioritize, but, you know, guess what? We're getting ding because we're not, you know, we're, we're not, <laughs> provide, you know, spending enough time on more strategic projects because we're, we're bogged down on other things, right? So that's kind of yeah. how you make that argument. Um, so effort versus impact and thinking through uh, and trying to put every idea into that matrix. Um, there's, you know, this is a little bit where experience comes in, right? Like, what do you know is going to create exponential pain and scalability issues in the future if you don't deal with it now? You know, it's really easy to you know, let, let's say you have a really manual or some something, some part of your deal desk quote generation process is super manual. You know, when you have 10, 20, 30, 40 reps, it's okay, but hopefully you're going to grow well past that. And even though there's a way to get it done today, um, that pain is going to escalate in the future, right? And so while it might not have a huge impact today, you know, you need to factor in your growth plans. Um, bringing it back to the budget, right? Like, you know, maybe you're not hiring a lot of people this year, but if you're hopefully we'll be hiring, you know, we'll be back to, to growth next year and hiring a lot of people, right? Is it going to cause a lot of pain? Well, it's probably going to be easier to fix now than it is when you're double the size. So that's another, you know, dimension. Um, and then, uh, you know, the other dimension is I wrote like progress over perfection. You know, the way my decision-making framework when someone asks me or, or, you know, ask the team to do something is what is the minimal amount of work we can do to have the, the highest impact? So it kind of goes to the matrix, right? But everyone who's on this call right now knows that there's, you know, for every project, there's like a perfect way to do it. 
that's going to be, you know, uh, solve every single problem and, and, and everything's good, but it's going to require an immense amount of time and resource. Start to pull that back, right? Like, okay, let's not go for the perfect solution. That's going to take, you know, 20 hours to do. Is there a five hour, one day version of this project that delivers a lot of value? Uh, maybe not all the value that we could, but is going to incrementally move us forward. And so I'm a big fan of, of incremental progress, right? Like, look, we can't do all of it, but let's do a little bit, make you a little happy, move on. And, and, you know, uh, I, and we can get a lot of stuff done. Um, and, you know, the last thing I think of when it comes to prioritization is, uh, and this is really qualitative, um, is, you know, the discipline to say no and, and not give in to the squeakiest wheel. Um, you, that's, it's really hard to do. Um, and I think, you know, being in this role for a long time, uh, I think good rev ops, uh, people don't, you know, it almost pains them physically to, to not be able to, to do everything that needs to be done. Cause you, you kind of see all the problems in, in the organization, but, um, you have to get comfortable, uh, saying no and get comfortable, you know, living with things not being perfect in certain areas that's just the nature of prioritization right like it, it you just kind of have to move on right and and that's okay right i mean i'm sure the majority of people who are listening to this are are working at startups you know pay, and people people know that this comes with the territory right and so it's having the discipline to to really identify what's going to have the, the highest impact yeah, that other stuff is causing us pain, but um, we're going to live with that pain for a little bit. So I didn't give you, you know, uh, uh, an exact answer, but those are all the things that um, that kind of, you know, run through my mind when I'm when I'm working with the team to prioritize, when I'm um, uh, trying to kind of align priorities with, you know, executive leadership teams and revenue leadership teams, et cetera. When you think about the amount of work that it's going to take to do whatever it is. Do you like t-shirt size that? Do you just say, well, this is a resource for three weeks or like, how do you start to think about the effort, right? Because it is not just, well, this is the, this is a huge impact. Well, that's going to take somebody three years to do I'm exaggerating, but like it's both, right? It's the impact and it's also the effort. And I think the impact's pretty easy to figure out like through like revenue or efficiency or time savings like we were talking about, but um, figuring out the effort sometimes is a little bit difficult. And I'm just curious if you just kind of like give it like a general idea of what that is or if you get really hyper-specific on it. That's a great question. Um, I think er earlier on in my career, there was a time where I tried to be really, really uh, specific and prescriptive on these things where I, I literally asked the team to come up with hours estimates and we, you know, uh, were kind of planning our, you know, I had like team capacity, everyone can work X amount of hours per day and that gives, you know, all that kind of stuff. That was way too much overhead. So at this point, I do do the t-shirt size, kind of small, medium, large, and, you know, you kind of know uh, what what's going to be a big effort, you know, things like just based on the team size that you have, who's who needs to be involved and, and how long it's going to take, right? Like how, what is the work actually, right? Is it just Salesforce work or does the Salesforce work then create reporting work, which then creates, um, you know, enablement work, which then has to be rolled out, right? Like it, it's it's just thinking about all the components, which, brings me to, I think the last point, which is, you know, anything that you have a gut feel is going to be a, a kind of large project, um, really getting good and, and having the discipline to put together project plans, um, which are a little bit painful and not everyone on RevOps is, is a good project manager, um, but it's a really important skill to have. It's something that I you know, continue to try to get better at as I, you know, get more experience. Um, but just the exercise of taking an hour to create a project plan 
that makes you realize, you know, what are all the steps um, and, and who needs to be involved. So even just that process of putting together a project plan helps you uh, understand the uh, the effort required. Yeah. Told you I was going to come back to this NDR example and we're going to, I just kind of want to dig into this because I think that this is probably something that a lot of people are like, NDR is the North Star for this year. And there's probably a set of things that people can be doing within the organization. And our, the whole goal of this call today is to talk about this strategic value that we're bringing. So how, like if I'm a RevOps person and I'm sitting here and I hear that NDR is the number one thing to go after, how do I start to figure out what, like, what to do. Like, I know that there's probably fields that we can create to measure things, but that's not, that's, I feel like that's reactive. I think what I'm getting at is like, how do we get like proactive with the problem to identify? And you gave some really good examples in terms of like the handoff process between like AE and CSM or those ROEs or whatever that stuff is. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's RevOps's true like job is to identify these problems and be like, this is going to make an impact. And if we look at this data, like, this is why I think this. So how do we start to like, how do we start that? Like, I want some tactical advice here of like getting into this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great question. I'm in the BI space. Um, you know, my profile as a RevOps person is data and analysis. So I kind of start there because NDR, there's there's obviously two sides of NDR. There's the um, you know, gross retention, gross renewal, churn, you know, depending on how you think about it. And then you have the growth from from the remaining customers. So what you know, it starts with why is your NDR your NDR? And you know, on the churn renewal side of things, who's churning, when are they churning, why are they churning? And you need to be able to have the uh, infrastructure, the BI and data infrastructure be able to answer those questions. Um, uh, you know, is it, you know, when churn cohorted churn, you know, churn by go-to-market dimensions that mean something for your business, it could be region, it could be country, it could be industry, it could be company size, uh, it could be uh, size of the customer, um, et cetera. Like all, all these dimensions, right? It, it, it could be that you have industry best churn or you know, renewal rates for nine out of your 10 segments, but for this one segment and, and voila, now you actually know where to dive into, right? And then the same thing on the, uh, existing customer booking side, right? Like, are you, where in your business are you under indexing um, and where, where can you actually improve, right? If it's, if you're low across the board, then you have that, that's going to give you, uh, uh, you, you probably aren't doing much, right? So you need to put in something. If you're under indexing in one area, what's going on there, right? Is it one team? Is it one, you know, type of customer, so that that's to me where it starts, and 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 I think that gives you like very good kind of diagnostic uh, ability to then formulate action plans. Um, you know, talking with the people who are actually doing it, right? The AEs, the CSMs, et cetera. So that that's really the most important thing in my mind. I was literally going to ask, like, do you spend time, you know, talking with? people in the field and not trying like once you kind of like look at all the data and you think you got like a good idea of maybe what's going on and then you're like okay let's go talk to some AEs out there let's hear how this is working or not working and try to understand it deeper yeah yeah I, I, had, think, I think that's the easiest it's one of the easiest things for RevOps teams to not do um and um, I've been guilty of it myself at various jobs, like not spending enough time just having direct conversations with the actual people in the field, but it's really, really important. And what you realize is that, you know, you might, you know, you might look at the data and say, geez, why, why, why are we doing it this way? Or why isn't this happening? Then you have conversations. There's usually 
pretty good reasons and logic for why something is not happening. Um, because the people that work at your company are generally pretty smart and have probably had the same thoughts as you. Um, but there's really good reasons why they haven't been doing things. So you need to understand that and uncover that before you can actually make it make a difference. Yeah. I also had this idea while you were talking about this, about like the the like God, I can't believe. The five, like the five, I think it's the five whys or whatever. It's just like, you look at this and you're like, well, why is it this way? And yeah. then you look at that and you're like, well, why is that that way? You know, and you kind of like start to dig into these things and uh, you'll get down to like the root cause of all of it. Absolutely. We don't need to talk no, more about that. I mean, that, that, that is, it sounds cheesy, but I try <laughs> to, I think that's a really important, uh, whether you do, whether you actually, you know, do that consciously or not, especially when you're doing the analysis um, to constantly ask why and don't stop at, you know, Hey, um, I'm going to try to think of an example, but Hey, this, you know, this turn rate has increased, um, in, you know, we saw a, an increase in turn rate last quarter. Um, and, you know, I'm going to look at that by, company size. Oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm noticing that SMB churn rates going down. Okay. Oh, some people might stop there, but continue to ask why and, and continuing to drill into dimensions until you can't go any further, uh, I think is really important. Awesome. All right. Uh, I'm going to, there's a, actually a pretty good question here from somebody, uh, that's listening in. So I'm going to ask this, um, uh, so it can be hard to get support for projects whose main outcome is time savings for RevOps. And I think that's that third bucket we were talking about, which is like RevOps is like doing stuff. Nobody really knows, but it's really impacting some of your bigger strategic projects because you're trying to like firefight and plug holes. Um, yet this year when capacity is, so I'm continuing the question. Yet this year when capacity resources are tight, projects that can give RevOps more time to be strategic can be very important to enabling capacity. So do you have an example of a project you did um, that the immediate impact was making RevOps life easier, aka like giving us more capacity, but it also gave the team um, the immediate ability to be more strategic. And then once that proje project was done, what were the new strategic things that your team was able to take up? So essentially, project that was like really impactful that alleviated a lot of resources time and resources from the rev ops team and then you worked on something else i feel like i'm i'm being interviewed right now <laughs> yeah i don't know it's a good question well, it's like a job interview um that's a very good question and i'm trying to think um of a good answer um you know, I think, I don't know if this is the best example, but, you know, I know we're almost out of time, so I'll, I'll, I'll give it anyways. Um, I, you know, typically, I think uh, Deal Desk, for, for those, you know, who are, who are listening or attending that, that manage Deal Desk, I think that's uh, a good example of, um, you know, sometimes RevOps, the way that you structure those processes, RevOps can be a huge bottleneck. Um, whether it's, you know, you're, you're, you have people on the team that are, are literally, you know, helping you creating all, all the custom quotes, or you don't have, uh, good automation on the, on the term modifications and kind of the legal aspects of, of quote generation. Um, and so, you know, I'm also speaking because, you know, as I start a new job, that's, I think that's one of the low hanging fruits there where, you know, it's a good example of for all good intentions, you want control over, um, uh, uh, you know, when, when a order form, when you make modifications to order form, because that's a thing, you know, you don't necessarily want the sales team doing that, but you, whether you realize it or not, you're creating bottlenecks, which make RevOps lives painful, you know, not fun. You create the need for more headcount, which, you know, companies, you know, CFOs won't like, right? Like if we continue to have to do these things, um, we're going to just have to add headcount and headcount. 
Um, and you also make the lives of the sales team miserable because they some you know they need it now and 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 you know they're tenth in line, right? And and so that's a good example of you know really taking time to uh, try to automate as much of the kind of quote to cash process. And it's like a win-win, right? Like you, you make RevOps lives easier, you make AE's lives easier, you save headcount, um, and and now you can focus on other things. So uh, I know I didn't answer every bit of that question, but that's just kind of top of mind for me. And I, you know, I've done that in the past. I think you know the legal modifications, order form modifications has uh, you can get really creative with how you automate things uh, there that kind of take RevOps and take approvers out of the process which uh, everyone really likes because because they can work more quickly. We're out of time. There's another question, um, but maybe we'll do this uh, asynchronous. We'll send a little note out afterwards. Um, before we wrap up, was there anything that you like silver bullet for everybody? I would say, I mean, look, it's, it's, as I was kind of preparing for this, um, you know, and, and it's it's around this topic of um, how do you uh, how do you how do you justify or how do you get support for um, projects that make RevOps, you know, that kind of make our lives easier, and you know, it made me really think that you know a good RevOps professional, a good RevOps leader, like what is the sign of a really strong RevOps team? It's that you don't even know that they're, that they're there, right? Like they're not really involved. And that just means that they've, you know, we've automated everything. We've provided all the training and, and enablement. Everyone knows what to do. Everyone can do it on their own. Um, they don't run into any issues. Right. And, and so it just, it's like a, I don't know. It's like an interesting thought that, you know, almost the goal of RevOps, even though you could, I define it as, you know, increasing the productivity of the go-to-market team, but an alternative uh, uh, way to describe the goal of RevOps is to, you know, we're doing a good job if we don't have to do anything. <laughs> so, you know, when you're thinking about how to prioritize and how to justify those types of projects, I think that's a really interesting uh, uh, angle to bring up um, that, you know, if you want a, a lean RevOps team, right, like let us focus on these on these things that are going to, you know, just help help the revenue system be more automated and, and take us out of the process. Awesome. Um, I, <laughs> do you do you have a little bit of extra time to answer this question? Yeah, I have a couple more minutes. OK, all right. We're going to run over. This is the first time for for. Uh, the fireside chat. I'm pretty like run on the train, you know, trains on time type of thing. So uh, what, is, what is your take on building a RevOps team, moving from an experienced one-man show to a strong, effective team? Uh, Sharon has asked us to focus on the functions we think are key for a RevOps team, as well as the prioritization on which to hire first and why. Wow, okay. Um, it's gotta be like 30 seconds of kidding. You could be a little bit more of that. Well, yeah. I mean, so if I was building, if I was literally a one person show and I'm building a RevOps team first, I want a strong CRM Salesforce admin because, uh, everything just goes to Salesforce, right? Like, Hey, we need this in Salesforce. We need that, right? Like you need to take care of that. The next hire is to start to align, um, I call them like ops generalists. It's kind of like someone who's really good at data, someone who's really good at business process, knows the business um, and start aligning them to the functional leaders, right? So I, I'm a big fan of there needs to be, as I start to build the team, a someone dedicated to sales, someone dedicated to pipeline, which is like BDR and, and kind of the pipe generation, someone dedicated to um, uh, marketing, obviously, like if you own marketing ops. So having those kind of dedicated embedded people that, that are, are there to, you know, live and breathe that area of the business. And I would say that if you're trying to pick out that ops generalist, like you're trying to hire that like second person, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I probably would think about where the biggest problems are or the biggest 
opportunity is that if you put somebody there, they're going to be able to figure out going back to our strategic projects and values. Like these are the things we need to work on to double our pipeline. Or if it's increasing NDR, then it's somebody that's like kind of working with CS and whatnot. And I think that that's kind of where I would think about putting somebody that um, would be first. I don't know. Yes. But uh, CRM for sure. Like that is the first thing. <laughs> that, typically, that typically is sales. I mean, just because yeah. that's, you know, usually the team that needs the most amount of help and is also the biggest. Um, but, uh, but yeah, for sure. Um, uh, understanding kind of where the, where the most amount of needs are. Scott, thank you so much. It's always good to see you. Yeah, and uh, appreciate you taking the time. All right. Thanks, everyone. Yep. Have a good one. Yep. Yeah, bye.